I think you know, or most of you know, that the Holy Father has uh, solemnly declared uh, this to be the year of the Holy Eucharist, October uh, 2004 through October 2005, the year of the Holy Eucharist. Now that follows uh, the year of the Rosary, and uh, that's not a coincidence. Uh, Mary always leads us to the Eucharist, always. Uh, Our Lady's vocation uh, is to bring us to her Son. Uh, She brought Jesus to us, and she brings us to Jesus. There'll be six talks or sermons in this series. Um, This evening, we'll do two. Mass will be in between. Uh, This first one is the Holy Eucharist as the mystery of life. Uh, Now, those of you who pray the rosary know that Pope John Paul II added five decades to the rosary uh, a few years ago. Uh, We now have a 20-decade rosary, and those mysteries of light are luminous mysteries. Uh, The last one is the institution of the Holy Eucharist. So I'll talk about the Eucharist as a mystery of light first. And then the real, true, and substantial presence in the second sermon. And then tomorrow we'll have four. Uh, First, contemplating Jesus through Mary tomorrow morning. And then the Eucharist as the source and manifestation of unity. Then the Eucharist as the principle and plan of mission. And finally, the priesthood and the Eucharist as sacrifice. These are topics which are um, nothing new, but they are main points in the Holy Father's uh, apostolic letter that he wrote in order to introduce uh, the year of the Eucharist. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, because I know that you are the pillars of the Church. You're the good, uh, engaged Catholics. How many of you have read the Holy Father's apostolic letter? Raise your hand. The one on the on the Holy Eucharist. Stay with us, Lord. Mane noviscum domine. Almost no one. (laughs) Two or three. Now I'm going to make I'm making a point here. When the Pope writes a letter, read it. And if you don't know where to get it, I'm going to tell you right now. You go to EWTN's website, or you call them, or you go right to the Vatican website. When the Pope writes a letter, he's writing it to you. And the reason the church is a mess is because of that. Because we don't pay attention. We're given gifts beyond measure, and we're oblivious to them. It's not your fault. I'm not blaming you. Uh, I'll tell you what, every diocese should send out every single letter to every single parishioner. And and not only that, I'd give them an exam on it the next week (laughs) to make sure they got it. This is important stuff. No wonder we are ignorant of our faith. Most of us don't lift a finger to learn our faith. This is the year of the Holy Eucharist. There will not be another one in your lifetime or in mine. If we don't even know anything about it, and that's what this letter does, this apostolic letter lays that out for us, then how are we going to get anything out of it? It's going to pass by. I'll tell you what's going to happen. It'll pass by, and the average Catholic, even the good Catholics, and that's you, I know you're the good Catholics. You go to Mass. You practice your faith. You're the good ones. The good ones won't even get it. And then we wonder why we have a disaster in the church. That's why. That's why. Because we remain largely ignorant of the faith. Now... That's what's called a lecture by your Dutch uncle, and I ain't Dutch. (laughs) I won't give you any more of those, I don't think, but then again, don't count on it. But it has to start there. 
That's absolutely appalling. Now, I could have said that about any significant encyclical or letter from the Pope, and, the, and by the way, you're no different. It'd be the same all over the, the world. The Pope doesn't write those letters to himself. He writes them to us. You know, his job is to teach, to confirm the brethren. What's ours? To be taught, to be confirmed in the faith. The world is in a mess because we're in a mess. The United States is in a mess because the Catholic Church is in a mess. Period, exclamation point. Jesus gave his church to hold the world in being. And to the degree that the church rises to the occasion, is faithful to her mission, we lift up the world. To the degree that we are unfaithful to that mission, and that means one person at a time. I'm not talking about a generic church. I'm talking about me and you. To the degree that individuals are faithful, to that degree the church is faithful. And to that degree our country, our community, our families, our nation, our world is lifted up. It's that simple. And so, it's not a mystery why we are in the worst shape the world has ever been in for hundreds of years. The worst. In case you don't know, we are poised on the edge of disaster. One foot in hell and the other one on a banana peel. Really? It is so easy. What do you think the chances are that the terrorists won't detonate a dirty bomb in a major city in the United States? I think the chances are almost negligible. It's going to happen. Why? Because we didn't do what we were supposed to do. Because we were weak-kneed, spineless, and rising up against evil. Every year that this holocaust called abortion on demand goes on, the country is more imperiled. Now I know many of you get that link. I know you understand that. To the degree we degenerate morally, we risk everything. Right after 9-11, I was preaching at a call to holiness conference in Detroit. And I hadn't planned this. I don't, I don't rehearse sermons or any preaching. I don't write them out, memorize them, read them. I just open my mouth, as you can see, <laughs> and start swinging, so to speak. And, I, and one of the things that came out of my mouth in that um, sermon called New War, Old War, was the following, and it's been quoted by presidents of the United States now. Immorality is un-American and a threat to national security. And I repeat it, immoral now I know there's always been some immorality, we're all sinners, we know that. But what I'm talking about, what this country stands for, what the founding fathers wove into the fabric of this great nation. Immorality, such as we have today, with abortion, partial birth abortion, rampant pornography, child pornography, the moronic Supreme Court justices can't even get it straight that you can't protect children on the internet from pornography. What's next? The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. As Bishop Sheen said, the approach of midnight, the approach of midnight, deep darkness and catastrophe. Why? Because we refuse to get it right. 
Well, we've made some progress, but we've got a long way to go. We've got a long way to go. Miles to walk before I sleep. Miles to walk before I sleep. The words of Cardinal Newman in one of his great writings. The Holy Eucharist, the greatest gift a loving God ever gave to his beloved children. The Holy Eucharist. It is a mystery of light. Let me begin by reading to you a passage which is at the basis of the Holy Father's apostolic letter. Now this weekend, even though you haven't read it, I'm going to try to give you some sense of what's in this letter and then encourage you um, to read it. Get it from the Daughters of St. Paul, EWTN, download it direct off the Vatican website, www.vatican.va, and you're right at the Vatican. Technology is a great thing. We really need to use it. The enemy uses it. You know, we, we should use it. Okay. From the Gospel of Luke, 24th chapter, verse 13 and following. Two of them that same day were making their way to a village named Emmaus, seven miles distant from Jerusalem, discussing as they went all that had happened. In the course of their lively exchange, Jesus approached and began to walk along with them. However, they were restrained from recognizing him. Now note this. It was right after the events of the Paschal Mystery the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord. Okay? They were disillusioned. They had put all their hope in Jesus, and he'd been taken away from them, crucified. And their hopes were crushed. And so they were talking about all these things. And Jesus approached them and began to walk with them. However, they were restrained from recognizing him. I, I want you to note that. They were restrained from recognizing him. Many would like to walk with Jesus, but they are restrained from recognizing him. He said to them, What are you discussing on your way? Halted in distress, and one of them, Cleopas by name, asked him, Are you the only resident of Jerusalem who does not know the things that went on there? these past few days. He said to them, what things? They said, all those that had to do with Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet powerful in word and deed in the eyes of God and all the people. How our chief priests and leaders delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. We were hoping that he was the one who would set Israel free. Their concept of the Messiah was political. They were held in bondage by the Roman government, basically. And they were waiting for a Messiah who would deliver them from that political oppression. Their, their sights were set too low. Besides all this today, the third day since these things happened, some women of our group have just brought us some astonishing news. They were at the tomb before dawn and failed to find the body, but returned with the tale that they had seen a vision of angels who declared he was alive. Some of our number went there to the tomb and find it to be just as the women said. But him they did not see. And then he said to them, What little sense you have. How slow you are to believe all that the prophets have announced. 
Did not the Messiah have to undergo all these things in order to enter into his glory? Beginning then with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted from the, for them every passage of Scripture which referred to him. Uh, he did a lot of interpreting uh, because all of Scripture refers to Jesus, either directly or indirectly. By now they were near the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going further, but they pressed him, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is practically over. And so he went to stay with them. And when he seated himself with them to eat, he took bread, pronounced the blessing, broke the bread, and began to distribute it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. They recognized him in the breaking of the bread. You see, they were, they were restrained from recognizing him. They couldn't recognize him. Just an, looked like just another man, a stranger. But it was at the breaking of the bread, the Eucharist, that their eyes were opened. And they were empowered and enabled to see Jesus for who he truly is. Now that passage goes a long way toward dis describing or explaining why so many people just don't recognize him. Even so-called religious people, they don't recognize him. Ask 10 million Christians who Jesus is. In the course of my travels, people have often said, oh, Jesus would do this, or Jesus would do that, or Jesus wouldn't do that, or Jesus wouldn't do this. They can't all be right. They say conflicting and contradictory things about the same thing. Many do not recognize Jesus, who he is. What opened their eyes? To the Eucharist, the breaking of the bread. Of all the gifts that God has given us, and there are many, to be sure, but of all the gifts God has given us, the gift of the Holy Eucharist is the greatest of all these gifts. It's the gift of himself. It's the gift of himself. Now, for a few centuries, we've had controversy and attacks on the Church's doctrine of the Eucharist and the priesthood. We have that today. You remember what happened when Jesus revealed the, uh, his teaching on the Holy Eucharist? Remember what happened? They, they said, what is he saying? Sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. He says, uh, we have to eat his body and drink his blood? What kind of teaching is this? They couldn't understand it. <clears throat> Wouldn't accept it. It says large numbers went away from him. They left him. That was the pivotal teaching. The teaching that separated the men from the boys. Who can believe this? This man wants to give us his, his flesh to eat and his blood to drink? What are we, cannibals? That's what they thought. Why? They didn't have faith. They did not have faith. Someone every now and then will say to me, Explain the Eucharist to us, and we'll become Catholic. They mean rationally, clearly, and completely articulate the teaching of the Eucharist. And the response to that is, I would have to be God to do that. No one can do that. We can say certain things about the Eucharist. But who has known the mind of God? This is something that you, you have to understand 
from the beginning. It's the source of a lot of unnecessary trouble. People say, oh, I don't believe that. Oh, the Catholic Church is teaching on this or that. I don't believe that. It, they, it, that's not really what they're saying. They think that's what they're saying. But what they're saying is, I don't understand it. Which is valid. Which is valid. You can't understand it completely. It's a mystery. When you're dealing with God and the things of God, much of what we're dealing with is pure mystery. The Holy Eucharist is a mystery. You cannot and will not ever understand it completely in this life. That's like saying, and I've heard this one too, explain the Trinity to, to me and I'll become Christian. Only God can explain. Oh, one, one God, three divine persons. <laughs> That's not a rational, full explanation of the Trinity. That's saying a few words. That's saying what we know about the Trinity. You know, I could go further and say, well, in, in, in God, we, we have one divine essence, one divine substance, uh, wherein there are three divine persons. Uh, the three divine persons coming to pass because of the opposition of relation, which then establishes each of the three persons. Wherever one of them is, there the other two must be in virtue of divine perichoresis or, or circumcession. And I could go on in that fashion. <laughs> but I couldn't say more than about a few words worth, you know. And you wouldn't understand half of it anyway. One God, three divine persons. That's the Trinity. But how much more there is. When will we begin to see that in heaven? For now we walk by faith, not by sight. Nothing in the Bible says without understanding it is impossible to please God. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. It says without faith it is impossible to please God. That's what it says. Faith and understanding are not opposed, but they're not the same thing. Okay, you understand that difference? Faith and reason, when I say reason, that's understanding, rational understanding, okay? Um, I might understand the laws of, you know, mathematics, or I might understand some principles in, in biology and so forth. That's a rational cognitive process. But the, the, the main tenets of the faith, they're not opposed to reason. But we grasp those by faith. Okay? Grasp those by faith, not by understanding. People make a terrible mistake. You know, you probably don't even think about it because you're good people with good, strong faith, and it just comes second nature to you. That's how it is with me. Uh, I, like St. Teresa say, used to say, she said, don't break your head with these things. You know, don't, don't get a headache with all this. It's real simple. You know? Hey, I believe in one God who is three divine persons. Let it go at that. The Eucharist, you know, at the consecration. Jesus, the high priest, saying the words of consecration through his ministerial priest changes the bread and wine into his own body, blood, soul, and divinity. Do I understand that? If I think I understand that, I'm a moron. No human being can understand that. I accept that by faith. I accept that. I believe. That's faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. When we say sight, that means sense, percep sense perceptible things. In other words, I verify something because it's, it, it's, it convinces me through my eyes, my ears, and so forth. Sense perceptible things. Okay? Uh, no, it looks like bread. Tastes like wine. That's the sense perceptible, the accident. But that's not the reality. We'll talk more about that tomorrow or, or actually in the, uh, in the next lecture after Mass. The Eucharist is a mystery of light. Why is the Eucharist a mystery of light? One big reason, well, Jesus, by the way, where we've got to begin and end, is always with Jesus, the person 
of Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is not merely something. The Eucharist is somebody. Jesus is the Holy Eucharist, right? Okay. He said, I am the light of the world. Jesus himself is the light of the world. Jesus is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Light is analogous for truth many places in Scripture, uh, where Jesus talks about himself being the light of the world. The light came into the world, but the darkness tried to overcome it, and so forth. At Mass, we have two essential parts. We have the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. They're, they're, they're inextricably related. Okay? There, there are logical distinctions. They're two things, but they're one. They're part of the same one Eucharist. For the last 40 years, the Church has tried to emphasize, and I would say with very mixed results, um, try to emphasize this, the liturgy of the Word to help him. Now, why do we do it that way? Let me try to give you, a, in a nutshell, an explanation of some sacramental theology here. At Mass, the liturgy of the Word precedes the liturgy of the Eucharist, or the consecration, Holy Communion, and so forth. The liturgy of the Word is meant to open our mind. It's light. The Word of God is Jesus. I, I think people go through their entire life as Catholics and Christians and never really get it. You know, the light bulb never really goes on. It's like when I was a kid. I went to Catholic school. I got Catholic education. Uh, I went to Mass every Sunday. I received all the sacraments when I was supposed to, but I didn't know a silly thing about my faith. I went through the motions. And that wasn't anybody's fault. It wasn't until years later that the light bulb went on. You know, faith kind of kicked in. The Word of God is not merely something. The Word of God is somebody. Our Heavenly Father, in the eternal silences of the Trinity, spoke but one word. His only word. His eternal word. Jesus. He has no more to say. Those are the words of the great doctor of the church, John of the Cross, St. John of the Cross. One word. Our Father spoke but one word. His only word is eternal word, Jesus, the Lord. In that one word, remember Jesus is the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Everything is contained in that one word. In Jesus, the Word of God, the Church exhorts us to make the Word of God the center of our life. The Word of God is, is where we go first at Mass. We have the readings, right? And Sunday, Holy Days of Obligation, Solemnities. We have two readings, usually one from the Old Testament, uh, one from the New Testament, one of the letters of St. Paul, maybe, then a gospel reading. Light, pure light. The Eucharist is a mystery of life. The Eucharist conveys light to us. Jesus is pure light. He radiates his light into the church. If your mind is open and disposed for the light of the world, you will receive it. Now, you will receive it. Here's a principle. I'm going to give you a principle. Good to learn principles. You can uh, solve a wide variety of problems if you know principles. Here's a principle. Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. Translation. You get what you're ready to get. Right? People receive as they are able. If you are well disposed, you receive more. 
If you are ill disposed, if you're full of yourself, there's not much room for anything else, right? If you have that, that, that debilitating, deadly disease called hardening of the attitudes, <laughs> it's very difficult to make progress in the spiritual life. So some humility is the prerequisite for spiritual growth. So things are received according to the way or the disposition of the one receiving. I can preach to a thousand people. I can preach to a million people, as I often do on television. And I assure you, only one message comes out of my mouth. I can preach this sermon, and that's one message. And, um, you know, it, it's recorded on tape, so I assure you I can prove that one message came out of my mouth. I can play it back. But I'll guarantee you, if a million people see it or listen to it, Every one of it will interpret it in their own way. Why? Well, that's, that's the human way. We receive that. I, I, I'm simple, so I need simple analogies. That message, the sound of my voice, everything that's involved in conveying the message, that comes to you and passes through your filter. Right? Your filter is the sum total of your intelligence, your education, your cultural conditioning, your life's experience, all those things go together to make up your filter. And so that message passes through your, your filter. The problem is most people don't check their filter. <laughs> and that's how we have get in trouble. But I, I can say something and someone, I remember when I used to, when I first preached after I was first ordained that first summer, I came home from Rome, and I was preaching at my hometown parish in Hudson, New York. And um, whenever I preach on Sunday, invariably the telephone in my mother's house would ring about a half hour after Mass was over. And it would be one of the elderly lady parishioners from the parish, and she didn't like the sermon. Didn't matter what I said, she never liked it. And she would say, how dare you say this and this? And I hadn't said this, that, and the other thing. I said, that's not what I said. Where, where were you? I, I was sitting right there, and I heard it in a... <clears throat> that's not what I said. Well, that's what I heard. Amen. <laughs> Amen, sister. That is exact, that's what you heard. Her filter was clogged. You know, I was saying one thing, she was hearing another. And so at the, at the Holy Eucharist, it's kind of like that. You get what you're able to get. I'll put it another way. Once I was preaching in Florida, I had just finished my doctorate, defended my, my doctoral thesis in Spain, and I, uh, I got my, my doctorate, came home, started preaching. I was in Pensacola, Florida. And I was preaching about um, how repentance and um, receiving um, the sacrament of reconciliation, confession, how that's so good for you, and that, that it kind of, um, you know, uh, clears out the, the, the sin so grace can flow. I was talking in that vein. All of a sudden, a light bulb went, in, went on with one of the men in the back of the room. I mean, you could almost see this happen. And, of course, when you're up in a place like this, you see a lot. <laughs> the light bulb went on, and he leaped to his feet, and he began to shriek out, Thanks be to God, thanks be to God for Father Karapi, the rotor rooter of my soul. <laughs> I've... <laughs> I've had many compliments in my life, but <laughs> ne never one quite like that. But, you, you know, you can understand what he meant. You know, the light bulb, when he, he, he understood all of a sudden that, that repentance cleanses you. It, it, it opens the channels for grace to flow. 
Um, the sacraments operate in virtue of their own power. Uh, we, we had a dictum in, in Latin that the sacraments operate ex opera operato, in virtue of their own power. They never remember to, to, to add on the second part of that, though, it, it, usually in recent years teaching theology. Yes, the sacraments operate in virtue of their own power. And then the second part is obicem non ponentibus, if you do not posit an obstacle. The sacraments operate in virtue of their own power. So at Mass, when the priest uh, says the words of consecration, take this, all of you need it, so forth, and the bread and wine is changed into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, that, the sacrament operates in virtue of it, its own power. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the state of the priest's soul. It doesn't. That's an old heresy, you know, where they say, oh, if the priest isn't in a state of grace, then there's no confection of the Eucharist. Wrong. Wrong. That's not how it works. The sacraments operate in virtue of their own power. However, you who receive them, the individual, now infinite grace is made available. Do you receive infinite grace? No. You receive grace directly proportional to your disposition to receive grace, your, your degree of charity, the clarity of your soul. So, if we are largely clouded up and cluttered up with sin, as long as it's not mortal sin, say we got venial sin, we're not very well disposed, we're, you know, we just had an argument on the steps of the church coming in and we're aggravated and this and that. You receive Holy Communion. Now, I'll tell you, th th this, this came to me once, <laughs> way back, right after my reconversion to the faith. I, used to, I started going to Mass every day. And one day, going out of the church, two elderly women were fighting like cats on the front steps of the church. And it just struck me, how could that be? We just went to Mass and just received Holy Communion, and these two ladies are obviously v very upset with each other. You know, they're, they're saying bad things to each other. How could that be? And I began to meditate on that and ask the Lord about that. Well, that's why. You see? You, get, you, you receive the degree of grace you're ready to receive. Okay? If you're well disposed, you receive a lot. If you're not so well disposed, you don't receive much. Better than nothing, but it's not as much as you could be open to. Okay? So you can get a thimble full of grace or a barrel full. And that, that's a, directly proportional to our life, right? A life of virtue, a life of prayer and penance and so forth. Okay. The Eucharist is a mystery of light. The Word of God is light, pure light. Preaching the Word of God helps dispose people. Good preaching disposes people well. Lousy preaching doesn't dispose people so great, you know? The people may be well disposed on their own, but they don't get that much help. You know, if all the minister or the priest does, he gets up there and he says, he, want, he doesn't want to offend anybody. And so he preaches a nice marshmallow fluff sermon on love. Now, there's nothing wrong with love, don't get me wrong. But his concept of it is emotion, let's say. And um, the people, you know, they come in and they go out and they say, hmm, wasn't, wasn't Father's sermon nice? You know, it, you know they, they, no one got challenged. You know, nobody got stopped in their tracks. A preacher who pleases everyone is good for nothing. You know, take them out and shoot them. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking. <laughs> oh, really. If, you know, you're not saying anything. A lot of, if you're a preacher, a lot of people ought to hate you. And a lot of people ought to love you. 
but you shouldn't be able to skate through unscathed with no human emotion being elicited. I have never been so conscious of being hated and loved since I've been a priest. Oh, there are people that hate me. They would kill me. I get death threats about every three months and have for years. Have for years. Great. <laughs> you know, if you got an abortion clinic and you perform an abortion, what I say offends you, praise the Lord, it better offend you or there's something mighty wrong with me. I'm not going to hell for any of you. I've got a soul to save too. And the way we save it as priests is by what we say, by what we do. Preaching is important. The Second Vatican Council emphasized it and made sure that they, they, want, they tried to make sure that the priests understood that the homily is an integral part of the Eucharist. Number one, it ought to be faithful to the doctrine of the faith. Number two, it ought to be centered on the readings for the day. Number three, it ought to be to the point. It ought to be able to be used in everyday life. You know, I, I don't have any problem with the relevance of the Bible. I can pick this up by the grace of God, open it up to anywhere, and preach an hour with no strain. No strain whatsoever. And I'll tell you, I can open up most of it and preach a controversial sermon with no strain. None on me, anyway. <laughs> and to not do that is dereliction of duty. Absolute dereliction of duty. And in recent years, we have had a permissive attitude that allowed just about everything from defective morals to defective doctrine. Why? Permissiveness. You know what the permissiveness is? You know, a permissive parent is a parent who lets the kids get away with anything. Right? And so, uh, you know, little, little Susie dresses up like a hooker to go to ninth grade school. And mom says, isn't she cute? And Padre Pio chased a mother like that right out of the confessional one day and told her she was a sure candidate for hell. <laughs> she was a little bit upset. <laughs> we have responsibilities. The Holy Eucharist, a mystery of light. We are a generation walking in darkness. And the darkness grows deeper by the moment. Luckily, in a certain sense, happily, at Mass on Sunday, large numbers go to Holy Communion. Great. Peruse the lines for confession, however, on Saturday, in most places they are very short. And it is the same saintly little old ladies and men going to confession. And all the rest, supposing that they are immaculately conceived, I guess, <laughs> don't bother. And they will come up and they receive Holy Communion. It's called sacrilege. Or how about the Catholic politicians, so-called? who say they are good Catholics, who say they love their faith, their faith is important to them, and they are the major protagonists of abortion and partial birth abortion. Catholics, senators, candidates for president, Oh, I'm a good Catholic. Well, yes, I voted for abortion 
and for partial birth abortion, but uh, that shouldn't affect my faith. And they go to communion. Sacrilege of the most incredible, depraved variety. And you say, oh, but you can't judge. I'd better make rational judgments and moral judgments. Because if we do not judge rationally and morally, history will declare that we were an irrational and immoral generation, duped by the fallacious sophistry that we can't say anything to anybody under any conditions. Absurd. Those politicians should have been excommunicated years ago to send a message. No excuse for it. It is a mystery every bit as deep as the mystery of iniquity itself that they can get away with it. That they can go on and that the scandal which is public can be perpetuated publicly. You see, when the scandal is public, the redress must be public. If you sin in private, you confess it in private. You know, no, that, if somebody commits a sin, even a terrible one, murderer, you commit murder, you go to confession, you confess it. God forgives the sin. When the scandal, the sin is egregious and public, these men and women are responsible for genocide basically. That's what it really amounts to. Are they human beings, these babies in the womb? Of course they are. What else could they be? Uh, tell me what else they would be. Are, uh, the mineral? Vegetable? You know, rocks? Frogs? Elephants? No, they're human beings. That's the only thing they could be. Science says they're human beings. The entire genetic package is there from the zygote on. So they don't accept science as well as theology. They have no rational argument. It's all emotion. I could go on a long time about that, but I'm going to tell you this. A lot of the evil that takes place in the world is enabled because of this human sacrifice called abortion. Archbishop Fulton Sheen on an airplane during Lent, about 1977, had a very, very chilling experience. They were bringing lunch on the flight. He was flying to preach a Lenten mission. And he said, no, nah, I don't think I'll take lunch today, you know. I'm Catholic Friday, you know, it's Lent. I can do without a meal. And the attractive young woman sitting next to him said, yes, I, I don't think I'll take lunch either. And Bishop Sheen kind of perked up and he said, oh, are you Catholic as well, fasting for Lent? And she looked him dead in the eye and said, no, I'm a witch and I'm fasting for abortions. And then she gave him the most chilling and accurate description of what takes place on the dark side of the battle. Large numbers of them fasting for abortions, which is tantamount to human sacrifice, which gives evil power. Why does God permit it? That's a mystery. Bottom line is, why does God permit any evil? In order to draw greater good out of it. He allows us to be engaged in the battle. Why? Sometimes I get mad at God. I don't know about you. Sometimes, I'm not proud of it, I'm not bragging here, I'm just being honest with you. Sometimes I get madder than you know what. I get mad at God because of some of the things that I see. Last week, two weeks ago it was, Super Bowl Sunday. I was in Birmingham. 
And I had a note from uh, a lady who's a receptionist at EWTN. And she's got a 10-year-old daughter dying from a very uh, bad disease, disease of the lungs. And uh, she said, would you go, could you possibly visit her while you're in town? And I normally can't do that because of my schedule. But I did. I did do it. Uh, I had a friend, and he drove me to Children's Hospital in Birmingham. And we found the little girl's room. Her mom was in there with her. Ten years old. Beautiful. Beautiful little girl. It hadn't, the disease hadn't progressed so far that you could really tell looking at her, you know. But it's a fatal disease. Cystic fibrosis. I was trying to think of the name. That's what it was. Cystic fibrosis. And you look at that or you go to a cancer ward in a children's hospital. And, and, and you look at that year after year and day after day and you can have your moments. I have mine. I've been with a lot of people on their deathbed. Why, God? Why evil? And there's only one answer. God permits evil in order to draw greater good out of it. He allows us to be engaged in the battle in order to bestow upon us a crown of victory. He loves us so much that he wants us to share in his victory, the victory of the cross, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no goal, no glory. And that's the way it is. It isn't easy. I don't like it any better than you do. But I don't have a better idea than God. And for some reason, he has decreed that the servant is no better than his master. And the way the master walked, so must we. And at the heart of that mystery, the Holy Eucharist. The essence of the Eucharist is sacrifice. And the essence of sacrifice is love. Authentic love. That love which lays down everything for the sake of the beloved not counting the cost, running the race to the finish line, fighting the good fight. And then one day you come to the end of it all, and you pass from time into eternity, the smoke and dust of battle having been stilled and blown away, and you stand before God. And you hear these words, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant, now, now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house. God love you. Okay, continuing in our series entitled The Power of the Eucharist, we come to the section on the real, true, and substantial presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. Now, backtrack a little bit. You, you understand that the Church teaches that the Eucharist is the source, the center, and the summit of the church's life, okay? 
I'll say that again, it's very important. The Eucharist is the source. In other words, that's where, where we derive all of our life from in the church. The source, the center. In other words, the life of the church is centered on the Holy Eucharist. If the celebration of the Holy Eucharist and, and the real presence of the Holy Eucharist isn't the center of your life, then there's something wrong. We need to focus, especially this year now. This is the year of the Holy Eucharist. This year we should make a commitment, do something special, uh, to draw closer to Jesus in the Eucharist. One of the ways you can do this is by studying this part of the faith, the teaching on the Eucharist. You know, we should learn as best we can. It's not rocket science, believe me. Uh, you, you can get this. You, you can understand the teaching every bit as well as I can. You take the Catechism of the Catholic Church, you know, some of the tapes, whatever, the, the Holy Father's Apostolic Letter. You read, you study, you pray, and you advance in your spiritual life. Believe me, please believe me. When you do this, you're filled with life, and then you radiate life. It's something that just happens. You don't have to be conscious of it. Uh, it's like one of the, another way that, that we can do this is through adoration. I'll talk more about that later, tomorrow, but adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. My goodness, Jesus is here. It, it isn't just a sign of Jesus. It is Jesus. Really, truly, and substantially present in the Holy Eucharist. Now, if he's here in the tabernacle, and he is, then where else could we want to be? Uh, but, as we know, uh, most of the church is scattered here, there, and everywhere else. And we don't have any time. For, you do, you're here. But when I, when I'm talking generally, generally, 80% of Catholics in North America don't go to Mass on Sunday. Now, I know you do. God bless you. But I'm talking in general here. Now, you may say, well, why does that concern me? Listen, I've been accused of preaching to the choir before. People have said to me, don't you know you're preaching to the choir? You know, you're talking to the good folks. And, and I, at first I, I thought about that. I said, gee, am I wasting my life? You know, these are the good people. You know, these are the people, they don't need to hear this. The, they already know it. No, wrong. Wrong. Even Jesus talked to the good folks. What he did was he confirmed them in their faith. What does the Pope do? He confirms the brethren. What do the brethren do? they go out to the rest of the world. So my job is to form you. Your job is to go out into the workplace, your family, the rest of the country, the world, and form the rest of them. Okay? So, we give you what you need, we equip you, and then you go out and live your Catholic Christian life. You have to have power to accomplish this mission. And the power comes from the Eucharist. Let me read to you what part of what I would consider the Magna Carta on the Holy Eucharist, the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. I would consider that the, the, the Magna Carta, the, it's just really the, the major teaching from the Gospel on the Holy Eucharist. I, I'll start here with the chapter 6. I'll begin here with verse 48. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven for a man to eat and never die. I myself am the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he shall live forever. 
The bread I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. At this, the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can he give us his flesh to eat? Thereupon Jesus said to them, Let me solemnly assure you, if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. If you do not eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Now that's the Lord speaking, eternal truth. Their problem was, of course, lack of faith. He gave the teaching on the Eucharist, the basic teaching. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't live. And he's talking about eternal life. He's talking about the power of sanctifying grace. In the early years of my preaching, in traveling around the country and the world, I would give parish missions. And um, as an exercise, it was uh, rhetorical in nature, you could say. I would give an exam at the end of uh, the day on Saturday. And um, simple, not complicated, ten questions. Uh, to show the people that they really didn't know their faith. The average grade was about 42%. And the questions were simple, that I would ask children, what are the Ten Commandments? You know, you get, in a ten-question exam, I'll give you 10% credit for getting that wrong. If you get one of them wrong, you don't get any credit. You got to know the Ten Commandments. Now, that's the first question. You know, think about it for a minute. How are you going to make an examination of conscience to go to confession before you go to the Eucharist if you don't even know the Ten Commandments? And I'll guarantee you, I can take a microphone and come down right now. You don't think so. I, I'll do it. You know I will. I'll come right down there and I'll look for a guilty face and I'll find one fast. And I'll say, what are the Ten Commandments? And, and somebody will say, well, will I, do, I, do I have to get them in order? <laughs> yeah. Right? That, that's basic stuff. That's basic stuff. The Ten Commandments, we're required to obey them always and everywhere and no one has the power to dispense from them. No one. Uh, and Vatican II didn't change them to the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> They're the Ten Commandments. And they'll always be the Ten Commandments. And you have to know what they mean. Okay? Basic stuff. In this teaching on the Eucharist, basic. It's very, very basic. Let me tell you something. Don't flatter yourself by thinking you're getting an advanced course in theology with me. I am a kindergarten teacher. Always have been. Always will be. When I finished my doctorate, the professor, who was the president of the panel that examined me, said, well, you've now received all the degrees you can get in the church. You've, I had earned five university degrees. And I earned him with highest honors by the grace of God. And he said, so at what level will you teach? He, well, that was a rhetorical question. You know, he thought I was going to say in the seminary, you know, I'll be teaching seminary, or I'll be teaching in a Catholic university, graduate students. That's where someone with my credentials would normally teach. But I didn't have to, I didn't bat an eye. I said kindergarten. <laughs> he looked at me. <laughs> That's right. Kindergarten. I'll be teaching kindergarten because 99% of Catholics are in kindergarten and never get out of kindergarten. <laughs> so that's where I teach. I teach kindergarten. 
Now look, you're good-natured people, and that's why I get away with it with you. I wouldn't get away with a lot of places, but I know who you are. You're good-natured folks, and you have some humility, and you can take it right between the eyes, and that's where I give it to you, right between the eyes. Now, I'll guarantee you, if you think I'm wrong, I can prove you wrong. If you think most people know their faith, it'll take me about 10 minutes to demolish that sophistry. Most people don't know their faith, and most of you don't either. And you're the good people. What is sanctifying grace? Now, you know, a lot of times we assume we know things, like we assume we know our faith. It's like my chemistry professor in high school, Mr. Stiles, the first day of class, we walked in. He had a limp. He had a bad leg. And uh, he limped up to the blackboard, and he wrote the word assume on the blackboard. And he glared out at us, and he said, never assume. Because if you do, you will make a A-S-S -S slash out of you and me. Never assume. <laughs> He's right. Never assume. You have to, if you have assumptions, you have to bear them out. What is sanctifying grace? 99% of you don't have an answer. When there's a question, you got to have an answer. That's not, that's basic stuff, by the way. You know, it doesn't have to be fancy, big words, nothing. You could say, sanctifying grace is a share in divine life. That's a simple answer. Good enough. Yeah. It's a way that we share in divine life. Where does sanctifying grace come from? Sanctifying grace comes from the seven sacraments. You know, sanctifying grace, as opposed to actual graces, or the graces we receive from prayer, penance, good works. Sanctifying grace. Sharing divine life comes from the sacraments. Okay? The Eucharist. In the order of time, the Eucharist isn't the first sac sacrament. Baptism is, right? You have to be baptized first before you can receive the other sacraments. Baptism capacitates you for the reception of the other sacraments. But in the order of grace, in a sense, the Eucharist is first. Why? Because the essence of the Eucharist is the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, the Paschal Mystery. That's the essence of the Eucharist. Passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord. That is where all sanctifying grace comes from. That's like the wellsprings of grace. And that channels grace into all the other sacraments, Paschal Mystery. Basic refresher. I know you know this, but once again, confirming you in your faith. Now, the reason many of you would fail the test isn't because you never heard it before. It's just that you're not immediately conversant with the, with the answer. You, you haven't quite formulated it in your You'll get it. It's easy. You'll all get 100 on the test. You're all A students in potential. No question about that. And, it, and it's not hard. Remember who Jesus chose to be the first apostles. They weren't men with doctorate degrees from universities, right? They were old fishermen. S simple guys. You can get it. Very easy. The Eucharist. Holy Thursday. Now we're in Lent moving towards Holy Week, right? That's the culmination, the, the apex, focal point of our faith is in Holy Week. Why? Well, um, the Easter Triduum. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and then moving into the resurrection of Sunday. The Passion, the Death, and the Resurrection of Christ. 
Why did the eternal word become flesh and dwell among us? Redemption. Salvation. Right? He assumed the human nature, became like one of us in everything except sin. So Jesus, the eternal word, a divine person, assumed a human nature and became like one of us in everything except sin. He suffered. He took that human nature to a cross. He suffered, he died, and he rose on the third day. Now, Holy Thursday, Jesus, this divine person acting through his human nature, that's called a theandric action. Theandric action. You don't necessarily have to remember that. That's a Greek word. It's two Greek words, really. Theandric action means an action of the God-man. It's the two words for God and man. Okay? Jesus, a divine person, acting through his human nature. What does he do? He takes bread. Says the blessing. It's the first mass. Right? Holy Thursday. What does Je Jesus institutes two sacraments... Holy, Holy Thursday night, right? Priesthood, Eucharist. Those are the two sacraments that are inextricably intertwined. They're all related. But remember this. I, I, my girls that work for me in my office, they have a plaque on the wall. And it's very relevant to these times. And on that plaque it says, No priest, no Eucharist. Remember that. No priest, no Eucharist. No priest, no source of the church's life. No priest, no center of the church's life. No priest, no summit of the church's life. Why? No priest, no Eucharist. And the Eucharist is the source, center, and summit of the church's life. Hence the attack on the priesthood. Why? Well, I have a a, a rather well-traveled sermon called Endgame. It's the name of a series I did. And the title talk of that series is called Endgame. And what did it, that's a term from chess. The Devil's Endgame. Uh, that's t get rid of the priest in order to get rid of the Eucharist. Because if you can get rid of the Eucharist, you get rid of all the power. That's the source of power for good. Strike down the priest, discredit him. And that's, that'll be my last talk tomorrow, by the way, on the priesthood and the Eucharist. This is very, very important for you good lay people to know. The morale, the discipline in the priesthood is the worst that I have ever seen. It's the worst that it's been in centuries, as far as I can tell. Get rid of the priest. You get rid of the Eucharist. Now, what happened that Holy Thursday night? Remember, Jesus is a divine person. He's a divine person acting through a human nature. As a divine person, he's eternal, right? That's basic. God is eternal. God is not constrained by time and space. God transcends time and space. And so Holy Thursday, this divine person acting through his human nature, takes bread and wine, and you have the first, you know, the Last Supper, the first Mass. Poised, as it were, above time and space, this divine person, the Heavenly Father's only Son, reaches forward in time to the next day, right? The passion, death, and, and resurrection we're talking about here. So Holy Thursday, Jesus reaches forward in time to the next day, his sacrifice, right? Good Friday. And he makes that present. He's eternal. And so Thursday night, you celebrate what happened the next day. How can he do that? He's eternal. He's an eternal person, uh, an eternal... Uh, he's, he's a divine person 
Hence, he's eternal because of that. 2,000 years later, that same Jesus, that same divine person, that same high priest, working through his ministerial priest, we are merely instruments. I can't effect the miracle that takes place at Mass, where plain bread and wine is changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Only God can do that. Only God can perform miracles. I cannot forgive a sin. Only God can forgive a sin, but he does it through me and any other priest. Jesus, the high priest, see, this is the principle of instrumentality that I'm giving you here, okay? You have a tool, a musical instrument, violin, piano, and a master takes the instrument and plays a symphony. The principle of instrumentality. Jesus is the high priest. I could ask you a trick question on the exam. I, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> but I could ask you a trick question like I, I do this to seminarians sometimes. How many priests are there, I'll say. Now seminarians study a lot, you know, and they're always reading and they know a bunch of facts. And so someone will say, there are 489,712 priests. Because they read it in the Catholic directory. It's, that's how many priests there are in the world. And I'll say, nope. Oh, yeah, that's what it is. Nope. One. There is only one priest, absolutely speaking. And that's Jesus Christ, the high priest. However, he has multiple subjects of action. Ministerial priest that he works through. So at Mass, Jesus the high priest, working through the instrumentality of his ministerial priest, takes bread, the host. And Jesus speaks these words in the power of the Holy Spirit through the instrumentality of his ministerial priest. Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body which will be given up for you. And then taking the cup filled with wine, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood. Who's talking? Jesus is talking. How's he talking? He's talking through the lips of his priest. But he's the one who's doing the talking. And his words have power. And what happens? That bread and that wine is changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Any fragment of the consecrated host, any single drop of the precious blood, and by the way, don't call it wine after the consecration. I've been all over the world, and Eucharistic ministers here, there, and I don't, they don't do it here because they're better trained here. But in many places, they'll do it, and they'll say, you know, uh, well, you know, you're going to, you, here, you take the wine, and you're, I want to grab them and shake them. It's not wine after the consecration. It's not. That's heresy. It's the precious blood of Jesus. It's not bread after the consecration. What happens? It's changed in substance. Now, this, I'm giving you a doctrinal teaching here on the real presence, okay? It's the topic of this talk. Why did I choose that as a topic? Because it's been under attack. And I'm not talking about from the Protestants. Oh, I love our Protestant brothers and sisters, and I almost never have any problem with them. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the Catholics who don't believe, the priests, the theologians, who don't believe what the church believes. I was thrown out of a certain religious order because of a fight over the real present. They didn't 
believe, some of them, that it was really, truly, and substantially Jesus after the consecration. One of them said, well, after Mass, it's no longer Jesus. During Mass, it's Je they were giving me a certain brand of Lutheran theology, and nothing against the Lutheran. But when you're dealing with Catholic theology, deal with Catholic theology. They say, oh, it's not Jesus after Mass. They, you see, they were... They weren't, they, they weren't purifying the sacred vessels, and they were putting them away in the closet in the sacristy with consecrated particles on the paten, some of the precious blood left in the chalice. Bothered me. And they'd say, you're scrupulous. i say, you're nuts. <laughs> it's either Jesus or it isn't. And, you know, and there was a running battle for a while. You know, finally, I went in, I used to go in, I'd sneak into the sacristy, and I'd check the sacred vessels, and I'd purify them if, if they weren't purified. One day I went in there, and it struck me so hard. Listen, this is Jesus. After the consecration, if it's sense perceptible, in other words, if it's, you can still see the, the crumbs of the bread, you know? You can still see the drops of precious blood. You know, even if it's just a couple drops, it doesn't matter. It's still the Lord. So I took all the benediction candles, put them on the credence table and lit them. Not the credence table, on the vesting table. And I lit them. And I knelt down and made a holy hour in the sacristy. And the provincial came in. And he said, what are you doing? I said, well, you all put Jesus in the closet. I thought I'd better make a holy hour. Somebody ought to. I wasn't long for that place. <laughs> I was evicted within a couple days. I was given an hour to get out of town. <laughs> Our faith tells us. And, and you know, don't you dare. I'll talk to you like my old man used to talk to me when he got real serious about something. He said, don't you dare do this, that, or the other. Don't you dare let anybody steal the essentials of your faith from you. I don't care what upstart theologian educated into imbecility says different. Our faith says... After the consecration, it isn't bread and wine. It's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And falling down, we worship him. And don't you dare ever let anybody take that away from you. That's what it is. That's what it is. And it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The essentials of our faith are unchanging. The truth cannot change. Why? The truth is immutable by definition. Why? Well, all truth that truly is subsists in him who is the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is God, a divine person. God doesn't change. Why not? Because he's perfect. That which is perfect admits of no change. God isn't on the way. He is eternally arrived. And so the truth, in its essence, can't change, and it won't change. And what we're talking about here is essential matters of faith and morals. I'm not talking about discipline, okay? Uh, whether or not we can eat meat on Friday... You know, that, that's discipline. That can change. Whether or not we celebrate Mass in Latin or the vernacular, that can change. You know, that, that's not doctrine. That's discipline. Many things can change. Sometimes they should change. But some things cannot change. You know, there's that, that, uh, so many examples. It's like the thing with women's ordination. The Holy Father said, as a last word, we don't have the power to change the teaching of Jesus Christ. And that's all there is to it. No pope, 
that ever comes along later will ever change it because he doesn't have the power to change it. Essential matters of teaching and faith and morals cannot change. We may want them to change, but they cannot change. And no amount of wishing for it will ever change it, and a democratic vote will never change it, you know. Jesus Christ never intended that eternal truth be determined by a democratic vote. <laughs> the truth is what it is, yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. I just quoted to you from the letter to the Hebrews. That's what it says there. So, after the consecration, what happens? We have Jesus himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Let me read to you from the Catechism. I'm getting old, you know. I have to wear glasses when I read now, most of the time. Christ Jesus, who died, yes, who was raised from the dead and who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us, is present in many ways to his church. Right? God is present in many different ways. Now, let me give you a, a clue on this teaching. What we're, gonna, what we're talking about here when we talk about the real presence, we're talking about modes of presence. Don't let the word mode, that's a philosophical term, don't let mode throw you. Um, it's a very, don't be intimidated by a four-letter word. It's a very small word, so don't be intimidated by such a small thing. It means way. A mode of presence is a way of being present, okay? So there are many ways God can be present to us, right? God is present to us in nature, right? He's omnipresent. Uh, God is present um, in the ministers of the sacraments. God is present in all the baptized. In a, really. God is really present in those ways. Now, the mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharist is unique. It raises the Eucharist above all the sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all sacraments tend. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood, together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the entire Christ, is truly, really, and substantially contained. Now this presence is called real which is not intended to exclude the other ways of being present, as if they are not real, but because it is presence in the fullest sense. That is to say, it is a substantial presence by which Christ, true God and true man, makes himself wholly and entirely present. Okay, so when we say the real presence, that doesn't mean that God isn't really present in other ways. He is. But the most noble, the highest way that God is present to us in this life is in the Eucharist. Okay? That's the, the way of being present par excellence, the church says, using the French. Okay? That's the most noble, most beautiful fullest way of being present. Now, when we say body, blood, soul, and divinity, we're talking about Jesus, true God, and Jesus, true man. Body, blood, and soul speaks of the humanity of Christ. Divinity, obviously, the Godhead, the divine nature of Jesus. All right. The last many popes have made a radical statement. They've said that the gap between what we believe and what we live is way too big. Right? There is a tremendous gap, a large expanse of distance between what we profess and what we live. 
Now, the Eucharist is a perfect example of that. I'm trying to articulate for you the high points of the Church's teaching on the Holy Eucharist this weekend. We believe this. All, what I'm talking about here, that's doctrine. As a Catholic, you either believe that or you're a heretic, in plain English, okay? It's not optional teaching. You either believe it or you don't believe what the Church believes. So it's essential teaching. Now remember, I didn't say you have to understand it. Doesn't say in the Bible without understanding it is impossible to please God. It says without faith it is impossible to please God. So we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, try to understand better. You, but first you give the assent of faith. People make a bad mistake trying to understand first. You know, they say, if I can understand it, then I'll believe it. No. No. That's not how it works. You believe it first, and then God will give you light to help you. But you will never understand it completely this side of heaven. In heaven, we'll understand a lot better. Why? Because he heaven expands the intellect. Your intellect is elevated and given a new power in heaven. You can see God directly, face to face, as he is. Here, only in a mediated fashion can we see God, through sense-perceptible means, through analogies and so forth. Okay. The gap. Back to the gap between what we profess and what we live. I guess it, it can be summed up in, in an experience I had with a, with a man who had been a Pentecostal pastor for 25 years. A very fine man. A man who clearly loved God. Uh, a wonderful man. From a family of pastors. His dad, his grandfather. And he said to me one day, I wish I could believe what you Catholics believe. And I said, Pastor, why is that? And he said, well, if I could believe what you Catholics believe about Jesus in the Eucharist, that he's really there, that he's truly and substantially there, why, you know, I'd come into the closest Catholic church I could find, I'd prostrate myself before the tabernacle, and you couldn't pry me out of there with a crowbar. Because if Jesus is there, where else could I want to be? And I said, oh, pastor, you're not far from the kingdom, buddy. That Christmas, he entered the Catholic Church. Because God gave him the grace. I'll tell you how it started. It's interesting how these things often go. Remember how I told you the year before, the Holy Father named the year, that year the year of the rosary? Year of the rosary. Led up to the year of the Eucharist. Very often, Mary opens the door for a closer relationship with Jesus. Now, tomorrow morning, I will talk about the Blessed Mother, as I always do on Saturday. Always. Since the day I began. Don't want to leave her out. Years ago, I was teaching a, a preparation course for the De Montfort Consecration. That's the consecration where you give everything to Jesus through Mary. And this Pentecostal pastor, he was, he was coming to the lectures. That's how I met him. And at the end, of it, it was a 33-day preparation. At the end of it, he said to me, you know, I, I'd like to make this consecration. He was searching. His wife had passed away, and, and, he, and he had had some traumatic experiences in addition to that. And he was struggling. He was in pain. And somehow he, he came to this Catholic parish um, where I was preaching for, for an extended period of time. And um, 
he talked to me. He's a very respectful man. Very, I'll tell you how respectful he was. At Ma he'd come to Mass and sit in the front pew. And at Holy Communion time, he'd come up with his arms crossed, indicating he wanted a blessing. See, he understood he couldn't receive the Eucharist. But, but, but he, he was humble. He was humble enough to want a blessing from the priest. That's very unusual. You know, that, that, you know, I saw in that humility, I said, God must be going to do a great thing here with this man because he, he, this, this is a very holy man here. Anyway, we got ready about to make the consecration March 25th, and um, he came to me the night before, late, and he said, you know, I've been with you these 33 days. I'm making this, and I'd love to make that consecration tomorrow. But uh, he said, uh, I just, well, could you go over that again? <laughs> 33 days worth. <laughs> I said, it was, it was about 11 p.m. <laughs> he went home, and he sat in his chair. He told me this the next day. See, next day, he came, he was right in the front pew, mashed for the, you know, um, Feast of the um, Annunciation, March 25th. And he's there to make the consecration. I went, what on earth? I mean, he made it. And I said, what happened? He said, well, last night I went home, sat in my chair all alone at home, quiet. And I couldn't come to it. You know, I, I mean, I studied theology, and I'm, I've been a, 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 a pastor 25 years. He says, it's just not my tradition. I just couldn't come to it intellectually. And that's, he, you know, that, that's, I can understand that. Many, many, many people who are brilliant could never come to the fullness of Christianity in, in Catholicism. They couldn't do it intellectually. I mean, Malcolm Muggridge, who was a great journalist from Britain, and he tried and tried and tried and tried and couldn't do it. And then one day he met Mother Teresa and boom! It wasn't an intellectual argument. It was laying eyes on her. And it changed everything. Well, old Don sat in the chair, and he was kind of agonizing over this, trying to come to it intellectually, and he couldn't do it. And he said, all of a sudden, I had the strangest experience. It's like on a cold day, you're standing there watching a parade, and you're with your mama, and, and, and your little boy, and she raps her coat around you to keep you warm and I knew I had a mother and I knew her name was Mary and so he made that consecration but he couldn't come to the Eucharist he just couldn't get that he, he, he was respectful but he just couldn't come to it that it's the same sacrifice of Calvary that, um, that it's really Jesus A couple months later, I was in San Antonio, and I was at the home of uh, some lay members of our religious society, and, and the, the mom of the woman was dying. She was elderly, had been sick a long time. And I celebrated, I was celebrating Mass in their home, in the, in the, um, in the room of this elderly lady. And Don showed up, this pastor. And uh, he lived, in, he was from Texas originally, and he knew these people. So I said, well, we're going about to have Mass. You know, you want to stay for Mass? Sure. So we're, we're just a few of us, you know. It's like the, the, the lady in bed, she was very dying, really, and uh, her, her daughter and the daughter's husband and Don. And so I began Mass. When it came to the offertory, I never say this, I said, we're now about to enter in. We, we don't repeat the sacrifice. We don't. We enter into it and make it present. Jesus offered sacrifice once for all. A lot of the differences that we have with the Protestant churches are the result of lack of understanding more than disagreement. They don't really understand what we believe. And I don't blame them. That's our fault. 
for not teaching that, clearly. But I, I said that. I never say that at the offertory. As I said, we don't repeat the sacrifice here. Jesus offered sacrifice once for all. But Jesus, through his ministerial priest, remember, he's eternal, he, we enter into the one only sacrifice and make it present. We don't repeat it. That's a theological fact. And then I went on. At the consecration, after the consecration, I elevated the host, as the priest does. I say, through him, with him, and in him. So I noticed out of the corner of my eye, old brother Don, he's, he, he was sobbing. He was shaking in his chair, sobbing. And when old brother Don sobs and shakes, a whole lot of shaking going on because he weighed three fifties. <laughs> and so he's sobbing and shaking. And I try, I tr went on and, and um, finished mass. And I went home after. I said, Don, what happened? And he said, Well, I was trying to pray and 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 and. and, and um, you know, at the consecration, I had my eyes closed, I was praying, and there was Jesus. I saw Jesus. I said, you did? He said, yeah. And he smiled at me, and he said, Don, enter in. And right there, I knew you Catholics were right. I didn't have the slightest doubt. I said, well, what gave you the clue? At that point, you know, divine intervention hit him between the eyes. What are you going to say? Well, it happened. Everything changed. God must have loved that, that old boy an awful lot. Uh, he gave him some extraordinary manifestations of his love. But, and those things aren't normal, and we don't normally need those things, but sometimes we do, and they can save a whole lot of time. <laughs> so old Don, he entered the Catholic Church on Christmas, made his first Holy Communion. Enter in. Enter in. Our faith is so beautiful. Our faith is so beautiful, so liberating, so empowering. How can you not enter in? You may have not known it before, at least maybe not heard it quite in those words, but now go forward totally confirmed that you're going to make progress this year of the Holy Eucharist. This is the year of the Holy Eucharist, remember. Keep, you know, I keep repeating things. Um, I read a study once that was uh, done on education. And it said that, uh, it's a psychological study, it said that you have to hear something 18 times before your brain finally keeps it as permanent. So I repeat stuff a lot. There, there, there have been people who have been listening to me for 15 years or so, and uh, one, one, uh, one elderly Baptist lady, by the way, is one of them, uh, in Mississippi. She, you know, she makes me cookies and knit, does Afghans and stuff and sends them to me. Baptist lady. And uh, watches me on television. And uh, she said, you know, I've been watching you for years. And one thing I noticed, you don't say too much new. <laughs> and I said, honey, you're observant. <laughs> you're right. And, and if I ever start saying something new, run. <laughs> there ain't nothing new I can say. It's 2,000 years old, and that's pretty old. But it's, it's ever ancient, ever new. That's our faith. And the Eucharist, this teaching on the Eucharist is magnificent. It's beautiful. Just, just think about it for a minute. Just, just think about it. What happens at Mass? I mean, the, the miracle of Holy Mass. Jesus, the high priest, working through his ministerial priest, the words of consecration, plain bread and wine, is changed in substance. Now, I'm talking about the doctrine of transubstantiation, right? That word simply means changed from one substance into another. They have not come up with a better word 
And if they ever do, it has to mean the same thing. So some of the weak attempts that have taken place in recent years to change that don't fly. Bread and wine is changed in substance into Jesus himself. Anything less than that is insufficient. That's what we believe, see. And when, when we take the host, consecrated host, put it in the tabernacle, you know, for the sick or for adoration, get this through your head. I know you know this, but, but I, I have to confirm you in your faith. I have to make you stronger in your faith so you can go out into the pagan world and give witness to this. Don't let anybody ever tell you that you're off your rocker because you believe this stuff. Oh, they will tell you that, some of them. But do not be swayed. This is absolute 100% proof. It's Jesus. What happens at Mass? It's the same sacrifice of Calvary. The one only sacrifice of Calvary. Well, how can that be? Well, remember who's offering it. Jesus, a divine person who transcends time and space. Hence, at any time and any place, he can enter into that eternal sacrifice and make it present. Any time, in any place. That's Mass. Hence, with what reverence we should approach Mass. With what reverence we should enter in to the sacrifice of Calvary offered in an unbloody manner every time Mass is offered any place in the world any time that's the source the center and the summit of our faith the teaching on the real true and substantial presence I've heard things like well it's a static presence some of the upstart theologians like to make a name for you, for themselves. You know how you make a name for yourself in the church or anywhere else? Say something that's controversial. Or write a book that's controversial. You know? <clears throat> or, 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 you, you, could, um, you could make something up. Like just fabricate something, you know? Pull something out of the furthest recesses of your vivid imagination and call it the Da Vinci Code or something like that, you know? <laughs> you, you, could, uh, you could do that, you know, make a lot of money. But as my grandmother would say, it's happy horse manure in plain English. Very, very simple. And so don't be swayed by silliness. Silliness, you know? When you hear that stuff, on television and you know Jesus married got married to Mary Magdalene or something say you know it's like this old Jewish lady she listened to my catechism series and she came in the Catholic Church so she went to RCIA and they started talking in this vein you know so oh yeah well you know uh, uh, Blessed Mother had many children you know Jesus had brothers and so on and uh, and, uh, and, and maybe Jesus even married uh, Mary Magdalene and so forth. And they came to the Lord, what, what do you think, Ruth? She, she said, I think you're all nuts. I, I, she said, um, and actually what she said was, you were there. <laughs> so you were there. <laughs> Love your faith. Love this teaching, this reality on the real, true, and substantial presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. The greatest gift a loving God ever gave to his beloved children, the gift of himself. God bless you.